Welcome everyone, it's good to be back with you. Today we're going to be looking at the role of envy on the spiritual path, as well as the connection between envy and shame, uh, and how those two destructive emotions can actually be used as fuel for self-investigation and awakening. Now, envy is one of those universal conditions that we rarely talk about uh, in a spiritual context. We tend to focus on the other six deadly sins, fear, pride, hatred, lust, gluttony, and sloth, two of which, by the way, hatred and greed are also among what Buddhists call the three poisons. Envy, though, gets short shrift as a topic of spiritual investigation in spite of its universality in, in, in uh, human life. The tendency to toss envy aside as somehow undeserving of our attention only serves to intensify the shame uh, that we feel over this petty, uh, probably most petty, uh, of human emotions. It gets denied, it gets shoved further into the shadow. When we deny our envy, uh, we fail to see how it can corrode the spirit and also how it inspires cruelty uh, of all kinds that we fail to recognize for what it truly is. For instance, trashing the achievements of others under the guise of constructive criticism. That's envy. Condemning the lifestyles of, of, of more permissive uh, cultures than ours. That's envy. Denying the rights of certain minorities whose strengths threaten us. Once again, envy. Attacking religions that are less restrictive than ours. Envy. Uh, and the list goes on and on. Under various banners of self-righteousness, uh, envy proliferates under the radar, and it's rarely seen uh, for what it actually is. That's not because envy is so hard to identify. It's because envy elicits a level of shame that the other deadly sins just don't. It's much easier to admit to being fearful or proud or lusty, lazy, gluttonous, even hateful than it is to confess to your envy. And that's because envy reveals vulnerability uh, and yearning in ways that the other uh, so-called sins simply do not. So let's start by defining what envy is uh, and how it compares to its much more talked about uh, cousin, jealousy. Envy is the emotion that you feel when you want something or someone that another person has. Jealousy is the emotion you feel when you fear losing something or someone you believe that you have, such as being replaced uh, in your loved one's affections by somebody else. Envy arises from feelings of personal lack, whereas jealousy arises from personal entitlement and apprehension over giving up what we believe to be ours. You hear the difference? Those are qualitatively different positions. They're, they're, they can be just as painful, but they're not equally demoralizing. Jealousy is talked about so much more, so it seems manageable, it seems even temporary, while envy, hidden under these blankets of shame, can just seem chronic and, and mortifying. The writer Dorothy Sayers uh, has a great quote. She says, Envy is the great leveler. If it cannot level things up, it will level them down. Rather than have anyone happier than itself, it will see us all miserable together. Okay, that's what envy feels like. There's an ugliness to it that jealousy, while not pretty or pleasant, doesn't quite have. Okay, the envy has a kind of a despair, a hopelessness, a, a willingness to level the world, to, to, to even the playing field, just to do anything at all not to feel smaller than or defeated. I mean, just think of a certain political candidate threatening a scorched earth strategy to victory if all else fails, just willing to ruin anyone who makes him feel small. Envy drives both megalomaniacs and sociopaths, uh, as well as so-called have-nots, or, or folks who are, are underprivileged in some way socially. Uh, because both the megalomaniac and the have-not uh, desire what they don't possess. The, the so-called have-nots want to feel like equal citizens, rightly. 
And, and we all have sympathy for, let's say, a, a, a street person uh, who envies somebody who has a home of his own. Okay, that's that's that is what you would call understandable, uh, justified, even uh, appropriate envy. But on the other side of the spectrum, you have megalomaniacs who suffer from what you could call God envy because they don't reign supreme and they can't have everything. Uh, and as a result of that, they're willing to punish everything and everyone around them who interferes with their desire for more. And between those two extremes of the sociopath, the megalomaniac, um, and, and the person who is extreme, uh, who is really an outlier on the uh, underprivileged end of, of, of a society. Uh, the rest of us live. The rest of us who are relatively more or less fortunate uh, and subject to envy for our own reasons. Reasons that are connected to self-worth, to expectations, to competitiveness, and of course to pain. Now, why is envy related to pain? If you look carefully at a time in your life when you have experienced envy, you're going to notice that that feeling is related in some way or other to a sense of injustice, a feeling of not getting your own, of being outcast or rejected or underprivileged or in some way abused by life. This sense of injustice is always accompanied by painful feelings of some kind or other. Injustice implies that right has been wronged, that the, the morality of the universe has somehow been thrown off kilter. And of course, the moral emotion of injustice is as primitive as envy uh, and can lead to positive changes. Okay? As, when a, as when an abused minority are, are, are finally given equal treatment. Okay? Injustice, the injustice, uh, which may have also brought feelings of envy with it, led to positive change. But it can also, this feeling of injustice, uh, lead to all manner of horror and cruelty. As when uh, sociopaths dream of final solutions to, to rid the world of groups that they detest and also envy, uh, whose, whose existence, their very existence, seems unfair to them in some way, a drain on the system. So you have the justified pain of the underprivileged leading to envy that can finally explode into the open and throw off its shame and demand a change. And you have the, the greedy pain of the envious who, who take their revenge on the underprivileged to comfort themselves and to feel a little more powerful. Now, as I said, most of us inhabit a, a middle place where we have more than others uh, and much less than many. So depending on the day, the shifts of circumstance, uh, we might feel fortunate or miserable, lucky or not quite enough. Uh, and in the gap between desire and complete satisfaction, uh, a space is left where envy, if it goes unchallenged, can fester. There's a woman who came to me as a writing student who, who illustrated this perfectly. Outwardly, she was a fortunate woman in her late 40s, uh, I'll call her Hannah. Um, Hannah was married to a professor of a major university. She had two healthy grown sons, a successful practice uh, as a psychotherapist. Uh, she was attractive, uh, she was healthy, she was free to come and go as she pleased. And yet, despite all of this privilege, Hannah was filled with this gnawing, irrational envy that had been with her since she was a little girl. Okay. Even though she'd never done without, Hannah was cursed with wanting what she didn't have. And, and this envy ate at her and, and undercut her well-being. She doubted herself. She criticized what she did have. She hated herself then for being ungrateful. And, and she was just caught in this vicious cycle of envy and self-judgment. In her first writing piece uh, about envy, I noticed that there was a recurring theme uh, in Hannah's work that came down to three powerful words. It's not fair. It's not fair. It started with uh, her writing that it's not fair that I grew up the way I did with a father who never followed through. Uh, a little while later in the piece, 
uh, she came to, it's not fair that women my age start to disappear around 50 and men don't look at me the same way anymore. And later she went on uh, about how unfair it was that the, the boys, her sons, had moved to the West Coast and she wanted to see them, but she had to travel. So versions of it's not fair were peppered throughout her writing as subtext, uh, throughout you know, everything that she was, uh, she was uh, describing uh, around envy. So there was this sense of injustice that permeated how Hannah saw the world and what she believed she deserved. Now, there was no doubt that her pain was real. You know, she truly believed that these things weren't fair. Okay? The, the envy she felt toward girls with strong fathers, toward younger women, toward mothers whose kids lived locally, was sincere if you can call envy sincere. Um, uh, and it caused Hannah genuine suffering. But in order for her to get behind this suffering and see where the envy actually came from, Hannah needed to dig a bit deeper. She needed to ask, where do these stories about justice and injustice come from? Why did she believe that they were true? Who first told her that life should be fair or give her everything that she desired? Did she realize how this version of things was holding her hostage to ideals and expectations? And finally, did she realize how this belief uh, in injustice was feeding the envy in her heart? Well, when I asked Hannah those questions, she was, she was taken aback. Uh, she'd been living for so long with her grievances uh, and the stories that she used to back them up that this suggestion that envy was connected to a story about injustice just seemed to confuse her. She was too blinded by her own envy to recognize that she herself was creating the conditions in which envy was sure to flourish. But when Hannah began to write about the stories behind her feelings and this vision of the way things ought to be, she started to see, slowly, that she had been selling herself a fake bill of goods a fantasy, a fiction about what fair fairness should look like if the world would only obey uh, her wishes. She came to recognize the central fallacy of believing that she'd been somehow cheated of what she deserved. And by creating that crack in her self-awareness and seeing her own thoughts in black and white on the page, Hannah began to, to gain a perspective uh, on the ways in which she was deceiving herself. That's the value of writing, of course, as a path of self-inquiry. It enables us to, to ask tough questions and see, uh, sometimes for the first time, these, these tales, these tall tales that we feed ourselves about reality. In Hannah's case, this recognition came with a shock uh, because she realized that running through these narratives was a very strong sense of entitlement, entitlement. Now, entitlement is a, is a tricky condition. It can look from the outside like low self-esteem. Uh, entitlement can masquerade as a sense of not deserving. It can be, you know, be shrouded in shame. But when you get behind the shroud, what you often find is a sense of having been robbed of what we feel we're entitled to by birth, by class, by reputation, or simply by personal value. The entitlement fueling envy uh, can manifest in, in different ways. Uh, Self-pity, uh, it can manifest in anger toward other people, it can manifest in sour grapes, uh, it can manifest in schadenfreude, which is the German word meaning uh, the pleasure that, that we feel over other people's misfortunes. And we're going to talk about those, those four manifestations later on. But in Hannah's case, when she became aware of the connection between entitlement and injustice, and injustice and envy, her perceptions about her own story started to shift. One by one, she started to dismantle this scaffold of envy and, and look at her beliefs about each of these imagined injustices until the scaffolding itself started to fall away. And that enabled her to touch on the true cause of her suffering, the pain that was really underneath uh, this, this belief uh, in, in, in justice, what, what Byron Katie would call her argument with reality. We suffer from our arguments with reality. And Hannah's argument with reality 
uh, was telling herself how things should be uh, that were other than the way they are. Now, we all do this in various ways, of course. We carry stories of entitlement and privilege and shoulds and oughts that create feelings of lack in us, disappointment. And those feelings of lack and disappointment can morph into envy against those on whom we project our disappointment. So ask yourself, how does envy distort your life? If you look at a situation where you have felt envy, where does the sense of injustice play into it? Where does the sense of uh, uh, the feeling of frustrated entitlement? Where do you not feel that you get what you deserve? And how then do you project that pain onto others? If you're able to admit your envy, uh, it can shift, but it may be too humiliating uh, to admit it and easier to express as blame or as outrage or as uh, victimization. So ask yourself, is it easier for you to play the victim than to admit to the depth of your own envy? And how do those dynamics shape your life and limit your ability to be happy and and to be free? These are powerful questions to explore uh, in writing uh, and elsewhere. Uh, And if you begin to answer them truthfully, uh, you'll be amazed at the shift uh, that happens uh, in terms of the amount of pain that you carry uh, and the argument that you have with reality will start to... to, um, diminish a little bit. Now, I'd like to talk about the four common manifestations of envy that I just mentioned. Self-pity, sour grapes, anger toward other people, and schadenfreude. So let's start with self-pity. Self-pity is, is as common as breathing. Self-pity is, is, a, is a condition that few of us are stranger to. But unlike self-compassion, which, mean, which comes from feeling with the root, feeling with compassion, and being intimate with the nature of our own pain, opening to the truth, uh, and releasing ego expectations. Uh, self-pity does quite the opposite. Self-pity is how we distance ourselves from feelings that are too painful. Okay. Self-pity is, is, it comes from the, the stories that we tell about our true feelings. Uh, and how we judge ourselves and the world through, through a lens where we fall short of what we think we deserve. This can be very difficult to admit. Uh, it, it can feel like adding insult to injury. But what self-pity does is locks us inside our own private drama. And locked inside our own drama, we, we resent our obstacles, we resist our healing, and, and we keep ourselves in a holding pattern of bitterness, of blame, of anger, and so on. So ask yourself, what is your relationship to self-pity? What secret pleasure do you get from feeling sorry for yourself? We all do it. There, this is, there's no criticism here, and there's no shame in it. But let's just tell it like it is. You know, what secret pleasure do you get from feeling sorry for yourself? What's the payoff for you? Because when we exercise self-pity instead of self-compassion, we cut ourselves off from other people. Poor me, oh, I'm so much worse off than anyone else. And that's completely different uh, than self-compassion, which recognizes our common struggle and, and refuses to consider our hardship as worse or apart from the suffering of other people. And that's why all spiritual traditions warn against self-pity. It's the ego's device to make itself special. We can make ourselves special by thinking that we are wonderful, uh, or we can make ourselves special by thinking that we are uh, worse off than other people. There's a, there's a Sufi saying that I love about self-pity, which I'd love to read to you. Let's see. Here it is. Overcome any bitterness that may have come because you were not up to the magnitude of the pain that was entrusted to you. Like the mother of the world who carries the pain of the world into her heart, each of us is part of her heart and therefore endowed with a certain measure of cosmic pain. You are sharing in the totality of that pain. You are called upon to meet it in joy instead of self-pity. The secret 
Offer your heart as a vehicle to transform cosmic suffering into joy. Isn't that beautiful? You are called upon to meet it in joy instead of self-pity. Offer your heart as a vehicle to transform cosmic suffering into joy. That's very different than being locked inside our prison of, of, of self-pity and envy. Next, we come to sour grapes. Uh, you, you must know the Aesop's fable about the, the fox and the grapes, where the, the, the hungry fox tries to reach the grapes that are hanging high on the vine, uh, but he can't get to them. Uh, and even though he, you know, he keeps jumping and jumping, he still can't get them. And finally, the fox just turns away and says, oh, oh, you aren't even ripe yet. I don't need any sour grapes. People who, who speak disparagingly of things that they can't attain would do really well to, to learn from this teaching story. It's easier for the proud fox to claim not to have wanted the grapes than to admit his disappointment and his envy at being cheated of what he believed that he deserved. Common, uh, sour grapes actually is a common reaction uh, when pride meets powerlessness. Proud people who feel that they've lost control of outcomes can fall easily into this pose, which protects them from seeming vulnerable uh, and yet is very obvious to the people around them. Whenever you hear someone talk a bit too vehemently about what they didn't really want anyway, you can smell sour grapes on their breath. I know a woman uh, who goes on endlessly about how she doesn't want to be in a coupled relationship. She, she has great contempt for it and, 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 and all the reasons why, it, you know, why it's soul-killing and, 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 uh, and something to avoid. Every time someone she knows meets a partner, she makes nasty comments uh, and, and distances herself from the person who has fallen in love. Now, it's clear as day to everyone but her that she's masking her envy with contempt. And yet it's safer for her to maintain this story than it would be to admit the truth, which is that she doesn't know how to be in an intimate relationship, that every time she tries it, it doesn't work, and, and that her heart can't take it anymore, and neither can her, her pride. So pride maintains itself by denying what it can't control, including all those things that a proud person envies but, but uh, remain out of reach. So look at your own life and ask if there are places where sour grapes conceal envy uh, and the truth of your feelings. This can be very revealing and helpful. Next, we move to anger toward others. Hannah's case was a good example of envy that had manifested into anger uh, and a prevailing sense of injustice. In an attempt to avoid our own painful feelings, we may lash out at those we perceive as our perpetrators, those who appear to be withholding what we desire, and then blaming them for our disappointment. Once again, there are, are times when these feelings are justified, when in, in cases of genuine oppression and injustice, uh, envy is completely understandable. Okay? It's, it's a sane, appropriate response to mistreatment or deprivation. But in the vast number of cases, uh, anger toward others whom we envy is self-centered and self-serving. It's a tantrum uh, against reality. And that anger conceals more truthful and tender emotions, which we can examine and, and, and actually yield uh, insight and, and self-healing, where anger, unexamined, just keeps you stuck with your fists in the air. So look at the anger that you feel toward others and notice if there is envy mixed in with it. Envy that may be rationalized and anger that may be rationalized using a, a sense of injustice. And finally, we come to schadenfreude, this pleasure derived from another person's misfortunes. This really is among our ugliest characteristics as human beings, even when the other person's misfortune is justified, as in, say, the case of Bernie Madoff, okay, who, who got marched off to jail after absconding with millions and millions of, 
uh, of dollars of other people's money. You know, a lot of people cheered when they saw him uh, get marched off to jail, and that's completely understandable. Okay, to to see you feel that justice has been done, and yet, in spite of his deserving his punishment, the glee that we're capable of feeling at the suffering of another person is itself. I believe, a kind of moral failing. The people of 18th century Salem uh, believed in their justification of burning women accused of witchcraft and the rightness of their schadenfreude. Okay, the Ku Klux Klan believed in their lynching of blacks and so on. Perceived justice is a very slippery slope and we can justify all kinds of cruelty and the celebration of punishment uh, when it suits our own moral code. It's really questionable as spiritual seekers uh, whether pleasure at another's misfortune uh, can ever be anything but uh, regressive uh, and barbaric. When a, when a murderer is executed on death row and the family of the victim uh, is cheering, it could be argued that they're participating, they're having a vicarious thrill of being murderers themselves in that moment. And it's very, very hard to transcend this barbaric wiring in ourselves, uh, which, which, which calls for revenge. Revenge was one of our moral controls uh, as we evolved in, in groups. The desire for revenge is, 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 is as, as natural uh, as anything that's, that's hardwired into our, our brains. Okay. An eye for an eye and the rest of it. And yet as spiritual practitioners, uh, we aspire in the opposite direction, right? We want to transcend uh, these natural uh, but destructive impulses and recognize our own homicidal tendencies if we, if we hope to break this cycle of violence. When we look at schadenfreude as a manifestation of envy, ask yourself, uh, where have you seen this play out in your own life? You know, where has envy uh, been quelled or comforted by revenge and, and seeing those whom you envy suffer? Are you aware of the, the spiritual duplicity, even the hypocrisy uh, at work there? If you're not, uh, I suggest looking deeper and, and notice how you may rationalize your own cruelty on the basis of a story that you're telling yourself uh, about people getting what they deserve. Okay, this is very, very rich territory uh, to explore. So the implications of all this in spiritual life should be obvious. While natural uh, and constructive in cases of real injustice, uh, envy is rarely personally liberating. What it does is keeps you shackled and selfish and taking other people's lives and fortunes personally. It locks you inside a prison uh, of shame and craving. Envy justifies shaming and blaming and projecting anger onto others uh, and can, if we're not careful, lower us to the level of animals who are willing to sacrifice uh, our decency for the pleasure of perceived revenge. And that may not be kind to animals. I don't think animals do that. I think we, do, we alone do that. Okay. So when you begin to show compassion toward your envy uh, and take the time to seek out its roots, where are you hurt? Where do you feel unjustly treated? And so on. Envy can be released from the shadow. And when you do that, the shame of hiding it can diminish. And what that does is brings mindfulness and equanimity. It restores right relationship to those whom we envy. When you recognize the depth of your craving, you, it begins to loosen its hold on your heart and helps you put aside the desire for revenge. That's how we make peace with ourselves and expand beyond our own hurt feelings in order to be able to show generosity toward other people, even when they have something that we want. This liberates us on a spiritual path, which is all about openness, right? Spirituality and awakening are all about opening and the willingness to tell the truth. And when we do that with envy, it releases from the shadow 
We can have a sense of humor about it. Ah, big surprise, envy, who doesn't have it? Uh, we can stop beating ourselves up for it and, and going into self-pity or staying in self-pity uh, and expand to feel self-compassion for this very natural, universal, uh, yet highly destructive emotion.